Hello everyone and welcome to our brand spanking new ninja house in Cambridge. I wanted to give you an update on the work so far for Senua Saga Hellblade 2. What we're doing right now is building a good chunky slice of the game before we then move into full production to build out the rest. Hellblade was very special for us and we didn't want to do a straight sequel, we wanted to do something extra special and so we're making our lives as difficult as possible in that pursuit. The game is set in Iceland, 9th century Iceland, so we've been sending out art and audio teams out there, doing photography, photogrammetry, and combining it with satellite data to recreate large swathes of the landscape. On the character front, we're building real costumes, scanning them in. We're collaborating with Epic Games to bring you next generation digital characters. On the combat front, we want it to be extra real and brutal, and so Melina, our main actress, has been training for two years and all of our animators have undergone combat training. And so what you're going to see here is not a trailer, it's not a gameplay reveal, but rather a montage of the kind of work we've been up to. Hope you like it. Will you follow me on this journey by sea, by land, and dreams through the valleys of despair, over the mountains of rage? To the depth of fear in my mind, you might see me as weak, but I will show you what lies behind my eyes. With our swords, we will forge new stories to strike the gods that haunt us. We will embrace our suffering, soothe our scars of grief, and break the siege of our minds. They may see them as gods, but we... We will show them what lies behind our eyes. Gau ari au fiatli in this nyota. With a 20 person team, Hellblade proved that smaller, focused teams can deliver impactful games whilst delivering breakthrough technology. And this is a philosophy that we're rolling out across the entire studio. And the teams on all of these new projects combined will still be smaller than that of a single, typical AAA game. We have a new calling, to be different, to take more creative risks, and help inspire others to do the same. So here are the new projects that will define us for the next few years. Starting with the sequel to Hellblade. So I'm 25 years old and uh, I come from a place called Paderborn in Germany, which lies in the northwest of the country. And at the age of about uh, 16, I decided to move to England and study photography and video editing. And around five years ago, I then joined um, Ninja Theory in Cambridge. And I was working on projects like Devil May Cry, where I filmed behind the scenes on the mocap shoots and I also created the game trailers. So like I mentioned earlier, my actual job on Hellblade was to be the video editor only and to create episodes about the game um, and put them online for the public to follow every step of game development. And only about two or three months into the project, my path kind of changed from being behind the camera documenting everything to also being in front of the camera as lead character Senua. 
So while Ninja Theory were still looking for a professional actress to play the role of Senua, um, they kept asking me to be a stand-in for their tech experiments or sometimes to just try out different styles of makeup for Senua's face or war paint on her arms, for example. Somehow I started getting more and more involved in the process without actually realizing it at that point. And they started asking me if I could act out little test scenes for them. Um, but they didn't realize that acting is actually my worst nightmare and I've always avoided it, even in school. <laughs> so, um, because the scenes were quite dramatic, involving crying and screaming, and I was um, having to perform in front of my work colleagues, I felt very embarrassed. and. I kept asking them to turn their backs on me or to switch the lights off because I just felt so uncomfortable being watched by them. Leave me alone! Shut up! I think they're more used to me being the clown of the office rather than a very serious person. So after helping out for a while, Chan approached me and asked me if I wanted the role as Senua and I was really surprised and had no idea what to say to him. Um, but Tam felt that I could do it and that he could direct me and she said that I'm already acting in the office every day without even realizing it. Very easy. <laughs> While Hellblade gave us a very personal insight into psychosis, this sequel builds on that to show how madness and suffering shapes myths, gods and religion. Our goal is to make an experience comparable to the epic myths and sagas of old. The team will be about twice the size of Hellblade's team, still very small by AAA standards, but aims to prove that small teams can achieve great things using procedural technologies and smart tools. Hellblade was a long and difficult project, and after that was done, I really needed a break, and so I went traveling. One of the places I visited was Iceland, and I was struck by the awe and beauty of the place. And that's when the first thoughts of doing a sequel came into my mind. I wanted to go back there and see the country properly and see whether it made a good setting for the game. And rather than using Google images or concept art, I thought it'd be much more interesting to take a filmic approach and location scout. So we contacted Saga Film and over two weeks we went to 40 different locations. We narrowed those 40 locations down to a journey that Senua could take across the country. And I returned there a few months later with our core creative team. Representatives of every discipline were there, art, audio, design, and Melina herself came along. I really wanted everyone to experience the full immersive feeling of being in such a strange, beautiful and dangerous country. While we were there, we also coordinated with Quixel, who happened to be out there with a few teams, traveling across the country, scanning different biomes, creating assets that we could use in our game. And we went further. We also took our audio team out there, along with Hylum, the band that we're collaborating with, to capture the sounds and soundscape of the land. So the goal from here now is to capture that sense of awe and epic of Senua's journey as she travels hundreds of miles seamlessly across Iceland and reproduce it, recreate it, a 9th century version of Iceland that is as real and immersive as possible. And this is the approach we're taking with everything in Hellblade. Everything should be based on something real. Whether it's a sound, a trickle of a stream, uh, the sounds of the forest, the lighting, the clouds, the landscape, satellite data, all of these things we're developing new tools and methods of assembling a grounded truth from which we can create our journey. With Senua's Saga Hellblade 2's development well underway, we want to take you behind the scenes 
of how we're making the next chapter in Senua's story, and just as importantly, why we take the approach we do. Just like with Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, we want to take you on our development journey with us. Our first stop in this new series of Dev Diaries is to look at how we've captured and realised Saga's location, Iceland, and in particular, how we're building a believable world that our players can sink themselves into. My name's Dan, and I'm the Environment Art Director here at Ninja Theory. After we decided that the locations would be based on real places within Iceland, we realised that we needed to get some pretty good reference for that. You can get so far by just looking on the internet and googling these different places, but it's kind of not enough. You need to stand there and actually feel it to get a real sense of the space. Relying on a location over 800 miles away across the North Atlantic Ocean presents a number of challenges, particularly when ground truth reference is so critical to achieving the level of realism we need. Our environment art team had to find creative solutions to overcome these challenges. First of all, when we knew that we were going to choose Iceland, like the first thing that we did is we wanted to see if we could get elevation data for the entire island itself, which we found. So we got some pretty good resolution data, which was about two metres per pixel. But then we soon realised that even at that resolution, it wasn't to the level that was going to work when you're down kind of at ground level with the player. So we needed to find a way of up resing that. We ended up settling on a service called Drone Deploy, which allows us to map out a capture grid, which is like a flight plan for the drone. You download that to the drone, the drone goes up, it takes pictures every few metres. You take all of those pictures and then you feed them into the computer and then it, through a process called photogrammetry, it recreates that area in 3D. So we've got a 3D model of that location to something like seven centimetres per pixel resolution compared to two metres. With a technical solution in place, we were then struck with unexpected news. When the pandemic took hold across the world, our team was sent home to work and all flights were grounded. It was impossible to visit Iceland and so we needed to find a way to capture Iceland without actually being able to go there. We had our initial trip planned and ready to go, all specced out, tickets bought, hotels booked, and then the pandemic hit, so that basically scuppered that. We needed to kind of find a, another way to help us out in the meantime. Initially, we'd been in contact with a photographer and guide out in Iceland called Chris Lund, who had helped us out with the initial location scouting, who had guided us around on our very first trip a few years ago. I'm Christopher Lund. I'm an Icelandic landscape photographer based in Reykjavik, Iceland. What's unique about Iceland is that you have a lot of variation in landscapes and you don't have to travel very far. Like you have this in other countries, but you have to sometimes travel days to be in something completely different. Here you can be shooting on a black beach on a very barren landscape and then you drive for half an hour and it's lush and green and dramatic waterfalls. This is the reason for Iceland being chosen for the game. A lot of my work is me just looking over weather charts and trying to maximize you know, the shooting time at each location. A lot of these maps are quite large scale, so the drone needs to go and it has like a 25 minute uh, battery life and then it has to land and have to change the batteries. And some of these missions are three battery switches over an hour of shooting and the light can change in that time frame quite often. Another factor is strong wind. You can't fly in a very strong wind, so that could also be an issue. And of course, rain is a no-go. What I've seen from the development of the game is amazing. Just the, the quality of the graphics and how lifelike it is. We spent a lot of time working with him like that remotely, which actually worked out fantastically because he's on tap, he's right there. If we want to go and recapture somewhere else or pick out some other details, we can just give him our flight plans for the drone-based photogrammetry, give him detailed um, breakdowns of what the things we want scanning, and we could send him out and do our bidding for us. Eventually, the world returned to some kind of normality. Our team could work in our studio again, and a much-anticipated visit to Iceland could be scheduled. We realised that we needed to go kind of bigger, so we basically completely replanned the trip 
from scratch. We added 21 locations, two and a half thousand kilometres worth of travel over 11 days, which was pretty ambitious, but we kind of felt that we needed to sort of cram it in as much as possible, you know. We'd been waiting all this time, so we just needed to go out there and kind of hit it as hard as we could. I'd been lucky enough to previously been out, so kind of felt like I was always banging on about what it's like to be there. And with the other guys in the environment art team, they had to kind of take my word for it it was essential that they come and kind of experienced it too. If anything, it's quite exciting to kind of go, look, this is how it feels. <laughs> this is what it feels like to stand on the edge of this crazy looking rock face or this cliff kind of thing. Getting the guys out there to see it in the flesh is like, takes us back to the point about reference. It's about, you know, there's only so much you can get from a photo. It was so valuable to have us all on the same page, you know, we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. Of course, our work to realise Iceland was based on ground truth reference from modern day. It's important that along with capturing the landscapes, we also bring to life the reality of Iceland as it was in the 10th century. So outside of visiting Iceland and experiencing the locations, we knew that we wanted to be faithful to the other things that we put in it. So think, once you start thinking about like the structures and the man-made things and that are going to be in the game. We want to approach those in the same way as we've approached the environment itself. Again, reference is key to this. We don't want to make what we think it looks like. We want to get as much reference gathering as possible and be as faithful to what the real thing would have looked like. When we were looking at some of the turf houses, which are the technique they used to use to build their houses, so it's like a timber frame cladded in lumps of earth and, and which had like kind of grass growing on and things like that. You spend a lot of time dissecting that, watching videos on people building them, trying to break it down into its component parts and being as faithful to that as possible. Similarly for things that we knew we wanted to make like various kind of trinkets or idols or different smaller props and things like that, we decided to see if we could make those by hand and then scan those, sticking faithfully to this idea that, that photogrammetry gives you that extra added level of detail and believability. That led us to set up some small scale photogrammetry in the studio, which we've got and we use as much as we possibly can scanning things like bones and totem poles that have been carved by, our, by ourselves. The level of realism that we're aiming for will really help with the immersion of the experience. It kind of stops you from questioning the space you're in. If we are using all of this kind of reference and these scanned items and things like that. As an environment artist working on this project, it's kind of the project that I've always wanted to make. And you could probably say the same thing for the other guys as well. It's having that ability to recreate something and then putting a slight spin on it yourself. And it's being truthful to the reference, which is quite exciting. And she said, with our swords, we will forge new stories to strike the gods that haunt us. You might see me as weak, but I will show you what lies behind my eyes. suffering, soothe our scars of grief, and break their siege of our minds. You may see them as gods, but we will show you what lies behind their eyes. Wait. your sacrifice to make, to lead others to death, brings a different kind of burden. 
one that Senua would have to learn to bear. That's going to be you. That's going to be everyone. No one's ever killed a giant before. What makes you think you can stay down? Those whose eyes are clouded by fear are besieged by the ghosts that haunt them. Senua saw that to win the war we must break this siege. Break it with an unshakable truth. Break it with an impossible feat. Get ready, it's about to start. Get ready. Now's the moment. You can do this. First the iron, then the fire. Yes. Yes. No! Hi, everyone. <laughs> Our guiding vision for MetaHuman has been the democratization of complex character technologies, allowing you to work faster and see the results immediately. A character is only truly believable if its motion fidelity matches its visual fidelity, but animating at this level is a hard task for even the most skilled studios. Some of our best work leveraged 4D capture, 
but this took specialized hardware and weeks or even months of processing time. While MetaHuman Creator gave you the ability to generate high-quality characters, animating them still wasn't as easy. This is why I'm very excited to announce a new capability to the MetaHuman product, MetaHuman Animator. MetaHuman Animator contains the essence of our 4D pipeline, but optimized to run on a single machine. It is able to use iPhone, as well as stereo professional systems, and today, we're going to demonstrate how it works. For this, we're going to need Mel, yeah. our technician John Cook, and just the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Mel, can you take your position, please? Sure. Yeah. Let me know when you're ready. OK. OK, and action. I need performance capture to work like a mirror. I need it to capture whether I'm acting scared or angry. <sighs> And sometimes, all I need is a look. Cut. Thanks, Mel. That was great. Yeah, you're welcome. OK. Our technician, John, is currently pulling Mel's performance from the phone onto his machine, where everything will be processed locally. We have updated our Live Link Face mobile app to capture all data at the best resolution possible with the device. MetaHuman Animator uses video and depth data to convert um, uh, this data into high-fidelity performance animation, and it can even use audio to produce convincing tongue animation. John is currently scrubbing through the take to pick the section that he wants to process. John, are we all good with the data? Awesome. So from now on, it's just a single button click to kick off the processing, which for a performance of this length will take less than a minute to convert into animation. So Mel, while that is processing, let me show you something else. Yep. Oh, is that me? Yeah, this is what we refer to as your metahuman DNA. Cool. And this is generated by the capture we made earlier, right? Yeah, that's right. So from only three frames of video and depth data, we can generate a rig that predicts all of your facial expressions in just a couple of minutes. Wow. And do you only need to do this once for each actor? Yes, that's right. It calibrates the solver to your face so that we can produce the performance in, in, a, in a way that faithfully reproduces your original performance. That sounds cool. Yeah. So let's check back on the, on the processing which today is on the latest CPU and GPU hardware from AMD. MetaHuman Animator uses a custom Epic Facial Solver and Landmark Detector. We can interactively look at the animation while it's being solved and compare it to your original performance. So it looks like it just, it's almost finished. After this, it's going to do one more pass to make the curves more stable, which is really quick. And from here on, we, can, we just need to export the animation. This takes only a few seconds. And then John needs to drop it in the level and add the audio so that we can see the result. So Mel's MetaHuman should now be ready in the level. Mel, you excited to see the results? Yeah, can't wait to see it. <laughs> I need performance capture to work like a mirror. I need it to capture whether I'm acting scared or angry. And sometimes, all I need is a look. Thank you all. So, Mel, what do you think? I think it's incredible because it usually takes months between performance capture and getting any results back, so this is blowing my mind. <laughs> and all of this is solved directly onto animator frame and controls. In this case, we are using a bespoke 4D rig, which we created together with Ninja Theory for Hellblade 2, but it's also ready to use on any MetaHuman or any other rig that follows our new MetaHuman standard. Let's have a look at that. <laughs> I need performance capture to work like a mirror. I need it to capture whether I'm acting scared or angry. And sometimes, all I need is a look. So the same thing works even on stylized characters. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. These technologies are completely redefining our creative process. As they will redefine yours, when we release MetaHuman Animator to everyone in just a couple of months. We've got one more thing we'd like to show you. We haven't forgotten about the needs for full performance capture shoots. What you're about to see is animation that has not been polished or edited in any way, and it took MetaHuman Animator just minutes to process start to finish. 
Yeah, so here's one of my favorite lines from Ninja Theory's upcoming game, Senua Saga Hellblade 2. And I really hope you enjoy it and the rest of the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Sign perf cut, take 13. <clears throat> I see through your darkness now. I see through your lies. I will show them how to see as I do. I will not appease your gods. I will destroy them. Cut. Good. You like it? <laughs> My name is Melina Jürgens and I work for Ninja Theory and um, I've been their video editor, their photographer and now also their actress. <laughs> well, I started 2012 where I was asked to do behind the scenes photography for Devil May Cry um, and then I evolved into being the video editor as well. I've done all the DMC trailers and then moved on to all, doing all the Hellblade trailers and all the Death Diaries that you can see on YouTube, the behind the scenes. And then, um, yeah, they just kept asking me if I could be a stand-in for their, like, technical experiments. <laughs> and, um, yeah, at some point the director was like, could you just, end, like, act out the scene for us? And I was like, mm, not really, like, I, I'm not an actress and I don't know how to act. And he was like, just give it a try, please. And then I did it and they were, like, blown away and thought I had some potential to do the actual job, yeah. I found it quite hard because I'm not used to being in front of the camera because my whole life I've always worked behind the camera as a photographer or a video editor. Also, I'm, I was quite introverted and shy and um, I found it really hard to come out of my shell and perform in front of people. So I think that's why my first ever performance was a bit overdramatic because I was just so nervous that I was just, yeah, I was shouting a lot. <laughs> but they really liked it. <laughs> But yeah, it was quite dramatic. <laughs> yeah, so we've decided to build an in-house motion capture studio in our meeting room, um, which like some people were quite annoyed about because the meeting room was always busy. Um, but we used like things from IKEA, like uh, wardrobe poles and screwed the cameras onto the poles and um, ordered like lights from Amazon and um, we just made use of it a lot, like because it was in-house, like sometimes we would shoot stuff once a week at least and just do like lots of pickup scenes and we were very flexible having the studio in-house. I don't really have anything to compare it to, so it's hard to tell, but um, I found it quite cool that it was so flexible because I'm not an experienced actress and if I got something wrong, I easily had the chance to just do it again the next day if I felt like it, because it was not a big deal, like we didn't have to go down to London and hire an entire studio for a day only because I got something wrong and I didn't feel like or felt like I needed to repeat something so we could just easily do that. The challenges were obviously the mental health side of things so the character um, suffers from voice hearing and seeing visions and we worked closely with a neuroscientist called uh, Dr. Professor Paul Fletcher and then some people that have experience with seeing visions and hearing voices so we had meetings with them and they told me what it feels like and uh, I had some lectures by the professor as well. So it was really interesting to understand the human brain a bit more and learn about that. And then, um, yeah, playing the character was quite challenging because it's a big responsibility to portray mental health. And um, I have my own experiences with it as well. Like my father had psychosis and I suffer from quite a lot of anxiety myself. So it wasn't so hard for me to connect with the character because I could just, I knew it from my own life. Um, but yeah, it was just a big responsibility on my shoulders to get it right because you don't want to upset anyone that has told you their personal stories, you know. I kind of often just spend some time alone in a room and just try different variations of how I would play the scene. And then on other days, I would just walk in and do it without even rehearsing it. So it always depended on like my mood, I guess. Like sometimes I would just not even read the script, I would just improvise. And sometimes if I had a sad day, I would ask if we could play a slightly more sad scene today. 
and if I felt a bit more energetic, I asked if we could do something a bit more like a fight scene. So it was a lot like method acting, I guess. That's what you call it. And um, yeah, just taking my own life experiences and my own like traumas I've had in my life, for example, and then connecting them with the character and bringing them out. So if I was crying in Hellblade, like if Senua is crying, then I was actually crying as well. It wasn't just played, you know, like it was real emotions. I guess the most surprising thing to me was how much patience you need to have, because sometimes if there's like a technical thing that isn't quite going well, you have to just sit there for like eight, nine hours and with people fiddling around on you. And I was quite surprised at um, just how it feels like you're constantly wearing this helmet and you've got lights in your face and you can't really see anything around you because you're always blinded by the lights and then you have all your representations taped to your ears so you can't hear anyone and you basically cut out like from the outside, you cut off from the outside world, you can't talk to anyone. So sometimes people will be like, oh, Melina, and I'm like, is someone talking to me? I can't see and I can't hear because I'm like in this bubble, in this motion capture bubble. I didn't really look for inspiration or anything. I just kind of tried to get my feral side out, I guess, <laughs> like the wild side. <laughs> um, spend a lot of time like just in the forest and shouting in the forest, <laughs> like trying out different scenes when I'm on my own. And um, yeah, just, yeah, I didn't really, didn't really look for inspiration. I'm still their video editor, so I still continue doing all the video side of things. I really enjoy that and I don't really want to give that up. So if I'm doing acting, it's a thing that I do on the side and then I also keep up my video editing. Difficult to get, get, uh, give advice because um, I wasn't really planning on working in that industry. It kind of just happened. But I guess I would say just try and say yes a bit more often. Like if there's something challenging coming along and you think, oh, can I do that? Can I not just like, just do it? Like when they asked me if I wanted to do that job uh, with the acting, I was like, well, I kind of want to, but I'm really scared. So I was thinking about saying no, but imagine if I had said no, no that day, like I would not be sitting here. So I think take your chances if they're there, just try it even if you're like scared about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping that we will develop the real time life stuff a bit more. That was really interesting when we did the performance where you could play a scene and it's straight away in the game. I think if we could explore that a bit more, that'd be really interesting because then you could kind of play the character and its environment and you know what's what it's going to look like straight away. You're not like just in a white room, but you can actually see straight away what it would be like. Yeah, that would be quite helpful because sometimes you're like fighting a monster and you have no clue what they look like. But if you could actually see it straight away, that would be quite helpful. Oh, <laughs> no.